Yes, in Dubrovnik. Very nice. It was my first time. I mean, international correspondent myself. We're doing this online television, mm -hmm. which is made by the independent journalists. We created that on our own and to create public broadcasting, like unbiased, not a tribal media. And it started with the revolution by, 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 by coincidence. And we became like a really big thing. I mean, but I'm international reporter, so I've been following conflicts. Like, not that much in Balkans, because like, yeah, I'm younger than that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, the contact, conflict of the last, like, all this, especially in the Middle East, but like, where the war about, so I can't tell. So I should explain, nobody here really knows about the Balkans, you know, and um, just to give a bit of focus, like, people know that there was a mess, but that's it. I mean, as well as. And I would be more curious to see that, especially after talking to the people in Croatia, um, I talked to the Germans. We have this feeling now that um, people don't really understand the danger of the war, the danger of the broken tie, you know, like, because that's never happened. So people don't understand how dangerous it can be, how easy what? it is. What? You mean in Europe? Con in Ukraine. I mean, like, uh -huh. how, how any kind of violence can trigger the violent misunderstanding. So in a way, talking to you, I won't really, I mean, it's up to you to tell. But I want to have some, not answers, but really the, um, I know there are no advice. But in a way, to clear maybe some threats to the society should know to what threats the society is exposed with the war coming, with the inside conflict is coming. For, for instance, the media. Uh, so I guess with the first question would be that... Oh, if you just tell yeah. me how long... Uh, it's all together, so I can, yeah, yeah. So I can it's be really clean. brief. It's, it, yeah, it's. Um, I would see what found that that when we talk in Croatia, a lot of people told it was a defense war, and in defense war, it was the question: Can you avoid the war if you need to defend? Well, for me, uh, this is an if question, which is not a good question because what would be if it would. Be, you know? So it's um, for me something had happened. Could you have avoided it? It's another thing. For you, it's a question: Could it be avoided? Um, but I don't know how far I have no. I have to say I have no clear idea how far this has proceeded towards the war. My little insight is that there is still time uh, not to go all the way. But it is hard to tell. I don't want to claim knowledge of something that I don't have knowledge of. Um, for us, it was, uh, I think, that uh, very particular situation. And I think this is the kind of self-defense. Uh, I think that the citizens of former Yugoslavia, uh, until last moment, so to say, were avoiding uh, the, the thought, the idea that there is, uh, there is a threat of war and um, they were pushing it, uh, this idea away. And to the point that when uh, uh, the front line was about 45 kilometers from Zagreb, people in Zagreb would sit in such a nice garden, drink coffee, and not being very much concerned what is happening 45 kilometers away. I think it's just a normal psyche, psychology of people that they don't want to see what is coming and they want to defend, protect themselves from that. Um, so uh, it, uh, it's, uh, somebody asked me today how should citizens behave in such a situation. It's very difficult to say. The second thing that I would like to say is, in my opinion, the, the war uh, always comes from the top down, from above, not from below. And uh, this is also my experience of these three wars that uh, happened uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, it is uh, basically a political decision. This is where your politicians pushed you into. But what we need to know is that the war has to be psychologically prepared. So I don't know if you in this country had enough time to prepare the war in the sense that it is exactly and precisely the media and the intellectuals who are in charge of preparing the war. Because in order to have any war, any really meaningful conflict, you have to turn the, others, the other side into enemies. You practically have to dehumanize them. When you dehumanize people on the other side, then you can only start proper war. And another thing somebody told me today here, 
we are at war. And I was walking in Maidan and I saw these pictures of the people who were, the hundred who were killed. And their pictures and their flowers and there are their names. My definition of the war is when the war starts, then you no longer know the names of the victims. So um, I don't think you are at war. And therefore I think there might be a way to, you know, to not to prepare the war psychologically, but just to sort of say, tone down the whole thing and try not to, uh, to become hysterical. But again, it is the matter of the political decision. So it very much depends upon the elections probably. No? When you talk about especially the preparing this psychology of war and dehumanizing, that we somehow feeling now happening exactly in these days. With like naming the terrorists, actually there are terrorists, I mean, it's, it's, I can't exclude it. But uh, so but is it, it like how to prepare to something different? Like, is it possible not to dehumanize in society when there is a huge, how to say, pressure, pressure to dehumanize all the, the others? It's uh, not easy for me to say because this is exactly what I tried to do as a journalist in the, in the 90s. I was against nationalism, I was against war, and so when you voice this kind of opposition, oppositional voices or oppositional voice ideas and so on, uh, the, generally the people around you, the nation, it was of course in Croatia it was the case of forming a nation state, you know. So uh, uh, it, it was a little bit different. In that situation, if you are saying, uh, well, nas nationalism is a terrible thing and it's pushing you towards the war, then you are a black sheep and then nobody likes to hear that. So if you are saying these kind of things, you, you, uh, you have to be prepared for the consequences or it has to be more and more of you. Maybe this society is, uh, what should I say, grown up enough. Maybe it's a society where people who are of such opinion and who then adding these voices one uh, together might make another kind of pressure. You know, because it seems that the civil society that was capable of Maidan is a, is a very strong society from that point of but view. But at the same time, so what were your answers to those who tell we need to defend people physically and you don't defend human life with the word, with the position that you're against the war? And there is a threat like, like people are taking hostages, people are killed, people are robbed, and it's there at the moment. But from that to a full-fledged war, they still accept from having uh, this situation that you described to make a step towards the war where there are so many victims that you cannot count them and you cannot name them. There is still some time and some space, hopefully, yeah, for a different kind of activism. What kind of activism? No, no, I'm speaking yeah, about yeah, civil I mean, society and journalism. No, but and it's this also kind the issue when we discuss a lot what kind of activities would be else. Because like, I guess you had also this openness who told like, you're calling for a peace, but we need to save lives. How yeah, can you save I, life with your words? It's yeah, nice to be an intellectual and talk. Yeah, this was uh, this was always the the argument against such a position. No? Yeah. yeah, so this is the argument. We heard <laughs> yeah. it as well. So anyway, like, how you answer this argument? Well, I was uh, advocating, uh, well, what could I say? I was writing what I was writing, and I don't put myself in the, in the same position here because it is not the same position. You know, and anyway, I'm not a person who would go and fight uh, uh, at, uh, at, uh, in that situation in, in Eastern, in Eastern Russia or in Croatia. I wouldn't take a gun and go and fight. You know? So it's all the it's uh, all the matter of the both individual and general situation. You know? A defensive war uh, is okay if it's something needs to be defended, but maybe before making this final step, there is something else. What I'm advocating is that maybe still there is a time to do something else. And anyway, it's not people who are going to decide that. That's my very strong point. People will not start the war. It will be the government, it will be the politicians, it will be the president who will give some orders and then there will be a war or it will not be a war. So it's not uh, you who is going to decide. You can influence the opinion.
but the decision is not up to you. What is the uh, not threat? What are these um, indicators which would tell that the war is not any more defensive? You know, like defensive is probably like, and what, how you describe defensive war? Well, if there because is an aggression, then of course uh, the war is aggre it's, uh, defensive, no? if you have an aggression. Yeah. Yeah? But if you yourself become an aggressor going into foreign territory, then it's no longer defen uh, defensive war, right? And we can agree on this very simple line. If your country is attacked, then it is defensive war. If you are attacking another country, going into the territory, taking a part of, say, Russia, then you are the aggressor. Have you talked about this kind of way when it's all presented as a, not ethnic, but a conflict, like a civil conflict between one, like the residents of the same country? But this is a civil war. This is a civil war. Can the have civil the war defensive? Well, this is, a, this is really a question. Can a civil war be defensive? I mean, it's a question of the civil war. But no, look, for example, you have Kraina case in, within Croatia. These are the Serbs in Croatia who decided that they would like to have an independence. But this is the territory of Croatia, right? So Croatia as a state is defending its territory and is saying to Serbs, you cannot have your, uh, your independence, right? So they could not claim self-defense. They cannot claim defensive war. Although they want independence, they cannot claim defensive war because they are their territory is a part of Croatia. Don't you think so? Yeah. yeah. And about the media, so can, I mean, we know the role of media are extremely important, but you know, um, what are the things to watch out in particular? Uh, well, this is also a very, what should I say? Um, situation where probably a lot of media are calling for patriotism, are they not? Um, and this patriotism, patriotism, we should make a difference between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism is um, a little bit different than nationalism because nationalism requires the enemy. Nationalism always says my country is better, my nation is better. And patriotism doesn't need that. So I don't know if you are still in patriotic phase when you don't need the enemy, or you already have the enemy, which you obviously have. And then the nationalism is building up this, uh, I would call it nationalist hysteria. So these are, you know, two different things. When this nationalist frenzy goes on, it's very difficult to stop it. So I, I, I cannot say, but I think that it's very important to keep a cool head as a politician because, as I said, they are deciding. And as reporters and journalists also, because it very much uh, uh, differs between a reportage, news, or selling ideology or making ideology. This is uh, being at the service of the politician. Yeah. It's very hard to find it out. Stick to, to report truth. That's always the best guideline for, for journalism. Don't sell yourself to the to the most popular ideology at the moment or the most popular uh, politician. And don't so let I would anybody have, so I would, use I, you. I would have this, I would, because we could run to so What were the things probably the Ukrainian or like the journalists in from Yugoslavia done wrong and what would be the lessons? Uh, don't look up to what happened there because in, in former Yugoslavia there, there was something what we used to call media war. So five years before any war started, this is why I'm speaking about preparation of the war, we had war being prepared in the media by the journalists from many sides, both sides, three sides, whatever you want. You know, so it means that there was a lot of war with words in newspapers and television and so on, and the other media for years um, before anything had started. So this is what I call pro producing the enemy, producing the other. You have to do that. You can't just come and kill anybody 
you are a madman, but if you are killing this person in the name of the nation, and you, de you then will become a hero. So, but it's a long, long way. Therefore, uh, don't look at the media in former Yugoslavia. Try to avoid the situation which was the media war. And uh, um, my advice would be report independently and report what you see with your own eyes and hear with your own ears. And uh, don't uh, try not to be used by political powers. If it's not a political power, but a society which has kind of a verge. Often it's like that. Well, it's this like is why opinion. you are a journalist and this is why you have to think with your own head and decide uh, what to do at that particular... Don't act under the pressure. I mean, it has its own price. There is a price to pay, but do not act under the pressure. And the point is, when you have a lot of... Uh, another problems like corruption, like police not running, and a lot of things. Uh, how easy, uh, what is the way out like when you need a unit to be united? To, to which extent you can forgive the former crimes? I'm afraid that we can't go into that because it's a huge theme and this is what I'm spending a lot of time uh, working on that and thinking about that. It's reconciliation process and let's hope that, I mean, that you will not be in such a terrible situation as we are now, because it's the post-war reconciliation. But it's something different when I'm talking even after the Maidan demonstration, where there were policemen and riot police who were killing the people. And now there is a question, how to include them, these corrupt elements, because they need necessary Corruption for defending, is, yeah. for, they, they're necessary for defending the country, but how to work with that? General rule of a thumb, I think, is uh, Maybe some problems cannot be solved. Maybe they cannot be solved immediately. But most important thing in historical terms and in the terms of present day of functioning of society is to address the problems, to bring them to surface, to talk about them. You can do a lot. You bring these people on, on TV and let them tell what they think, what was their situation. You see what I mean? You have to make it public. That's the most important thing. Sorry, yeah, no, I no, 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 no,